Friends, welcome to worship. Welcome to those who are online and those who are here in person. It is so good for us to be gathered together around the Word of God. Today, you'll see a lot of items in front of the communion table. It's because we are dedicating all these items to go into the blessing box in new work at First Presbyterian Church. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on in our service. But thank you to everybody who contributed to those and to everybody who helped with the bake sale yesterday. I understand we've got more baked goods that we'll be selling or receiving an offering for tonight at the concert on the bricks and hope you'll come back for that as well. If you have prayer requests this morning, either um, hopefully have filled something out in paper or you can email to prayers at grandpres.org and we'll include your joys and concerns in our prayers this morning. Our worship this morning focuses on the last of three parables found in Matthew 25. In the first parable, the story of the ten bridesmaids or groom's maids, as I think is more accurate, Jesus teaches us to keep our lamps trimmed and burning, or as the Apostle Paul puts it, to keep ourselves fueled and aflame for the master. The second story, the parable of the talents, pushes us to take risks instead of trying to play it safe. Both of these are prerequisites for us to live as Jesus would have us live which leads us to the third and final story, Jesus' teaching about service. As we begin our worship today, let's listen to the word of God and this parable that Jesus teaches. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. I'm reading from the Good News Version. When the Son of Man comes as king and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne, and the people of all nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the righteous people at his right and the others at his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, come you that are blessed by my father, come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you received me in your homes, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me, in prison and you visited me. The righteous will then answer him, when Lord did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you as a stranger and welcome you in our homes or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Service to our God. 
In the book of 1 John, the writer reminds us that we all commit sin. And if we say we don't, we're deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. When we deceive ourselves so surely, it leaves us with a troubled spirit. But if we can admit to ourselves our shortcomings and our misdeeds and confess our sin, God will forgive us and cleanse our spirit. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in the order of worship and let our prayer be followed by a moment of silence for our private thoughts. Let us pray. God, we hear your call to serve others. We know it's the heart of your gospel to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Most of the time, our hearts are in the right place, and we want to live what you command. But sometimes we're too exhausted to care for anyone else. We've become burned out, cynical, and spent. And sometimes we're leery of taking risks. We're not sure what good will come of our efforts. So we play it safe and walk away. Forgive us, God. Re-energize us for your work. Fill us with your love. Then teach us how to serve the neighbor we have from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. We come to worship because we offer ourselves to God, to God's care, to God changing us, to God's word working within us. And we offer ourselves to God in giving ourselves in so many ways, whether it's financially through an offering or whether it's through a new commitment or a sense of call. During this time of music, I invite you to consider what offering you are being called to give.
I swear that as you sang, I felt my spine grow longer and my heart grow stronger and my spirit grow calmer. Thank you so much. Our second scripture reading continues where the first one left off. I'm going to read the introductory verses again that Jesus begins this parable with and then go to the second part of the story. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats on his left. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, Depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Show of hands, who wants to be a goat? Anybody, any takers? Any sheep? Anybody want to be a sheep? Come on, I know you do. You want to be a sheep. Before we dive into this story and the tensions of it, I want to talk a little bit about this picture that is here in front of us this morning. This picture actually comes from the last time we had our official um, photo directory made for our church. And the company that put it together put this together as a gift to us. It's supposed to be Jesus, right? <laughs> If you had a children's sermon and you said, who is this? The answer would be Jesus, because the answer in a children's sermon is always Jesus. <laughs> what you might not be able to see is that what it's made up of are tiny, tiny little photos of different people. It's made up of tiny photos of everyone who was in that church directory. It's a powerful visual of that verse from 1 Corinthians 12, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Individually, we're just us, but knit together, we're something more. We are Christ's body. We are Christ's hands and feet in the world. I thought about this picture as I was working through the passage for today. There's a phrase that we use often in our mission statement, and it's actually on here. Seeing Christ in the face of others. Especially seeing Christ in the face of the least of these, our brothers and sisters. Now, it seems to me that it would be very hard to argue against doing that, right? It's obviously a good thing to do. Taking care of other people is, generally speaking, a good thing to do. And looking for what is precious and holy in others, seeing Christ in the face of others, and of course that's a good thing to do. You don't even need to be a Christian to think that looking for what is precious and holy in someone is the right thing. At yoga practice, the leader will often end the practice by putting hands together in what we call prayer and saying, 
The light and love in me sees and honors the light and love in you. That is a very good thing. And Lord knows that church people want to be good. We definitely want to be sheep, not goats. We appreciate the power of acts of kindness and hospitality and service. We like to think that we are the good guys. Which leads me to wonder, honestly, did Jesus really need to tell this parable? Did Jesus actually need to say this out loud to his disciples for them to understand? Well, maybe yes. <laughs> and what I believe is that he needs to keep telling us this too. Because the truth is that while this sounds fabulous, it is so hard to actually live it out. Because it turns out that helping other people can turn into a sticky, hot mess. Now, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I mean, honestly, it's great to help if it's a one-off kind of deal. But day in and day out gets tricky. It's one thing to build a Habitat for Humanity house. It's another thing to help a family week after week after week as they are trying to get their act together. It's one thing to send a financial gift to a nonprofit you respect, and that is a wonderful thing. It's another thing to get to know homeless folks who are living under the bridge because you are taking them meals every single week. I honestly think that the hardest thing of all may be trying to help a family member, somebody that you know and love personally, to figure out where your right and responsibility begins and ends, to be clear about what's theirs and what's yours and where the boundaries are. I mean, of course we want to be sheep, Jesus. And this all sounds great, but real life is messy and complicated, and we do not always perform well. For one thing, it's really easy to burn out. That's what we heard from the reading from Matthew 25 a couple of weeks ago. Especially if we become disconnected from the light and love of God, we are very likely to burn out especially if we're expecting miraculous things to occur, we are likely to become disillusioned. Especially if we think we are performing some wonderful act of charity to prove ourselves worthy of God, we are likely to burn out. Remember the way the Apostle Paul put it? He said, living then as every one of you does in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. Frankly, if we think that we are going to swoop in and fix somebody and have them be all better, we better think twice about helping. Change is a long, slow process, and we are not in charge. Jesus is not inviting us to be some heroic miracle workers. He is telling us to be servants. Then there's that other parable from Matthew 25, the one about the talents. Jesus was all too aware of how averse we are to risk. We may want to change other people's lives, but what happens if that means going out on a limb ourselves? This is scary stuff. We may very well fail. 
we may start looking for someone to blame. We may justify ourselves to save face. All kinds of not very Christian-y sorts of things. Can we stay connected to God's love enough to keep risking? That's what we need to find out. One of the goals that emerged from our church's Mind the Gap survey was having us do more hands-on mission, just the kind of stuff that Jesus is talking about in this parable. A lot of you said this is really important to you. Our church has been committed to mission for a very long time, mostly in the form of giving money to organizations like Healing Arts Mission and Coalition of Care. And I know many, many members have also volunteered in places like the Food Pantry or Salvation Army or Sharing the Harvest. And many of you give very graciously and willingly to a whole host of nonprofits in the area. You are generous with your talent and your time and your treasure. You are generous. You want to take this to the next level. It's a risk, but you want to see how much more we can do. One change that we're exploring is whether to have a very specific focus for mission as a congregation. And the mission committee has been working for several years now to figure out whether we can and should and what would it be. What would happen if we set our sights on one particular need, on something that we're really especially suited for? What if we did the hard, hard work of building relationships with people in poverty before we dove in? What would happen if we took on hands-on mission and took it to heart? What might it look like? The best way I know to answer that question is to tell some stories. Stories of other people and places who have done just that. The first is a story about a friend of mine, an acquaintance really, whom I knew when I was in Des Moines, Iowa. Burn Stanfield had grown up in one of the churches there, Knox Presbyterian and I knew him through his dad, Paul. Paul was an active elder in their church, and Paul and his family had welcomed me when I came to the presbytery as a green young pastor. Burns was about my age. He was a recent graduate of Harvard Divinity School, and he served a small, struggling congregation in South Boston near the projects. The one thing they had going for them was an amazing music ministry in large part because Burns himself was a musician, and he had tons of musician friends from his days at Harvard. One day, Burns learned about a need in their community, and he thought it was something that they could help with. The kids in the projects were all part of the free school lunch program, but Burns learned that that program ended during the summer because they couldn't serve meals through the schools and there was no feeding site. So he conferred with their session and the church decided that they could be a food site for the kids during the summer months, especially because there was so little going on in their church in those days. And the kids came. It was terrific. And they started coming earlier and earlier and earlier and staying longer and longer and longer and pretty soon they had this church swarming with kids from the projects, and they had to figure out what to do with them. Did they just say, lunch is over, go home? What they decided to do was teach them music. Burns rallied his church folk and friends, and they started giving music lessons. 
I'm not sure what all was involved. This was a long time ago and my memory is fuzzy. But I do know that at the time it was intense. And I also know it changed kids' lives. Even more, I know that it changed the church. Burns is still the pastor there. And out of curiosity, I looked up their church to see what was going on. And Fourth Presbyterian Church in Boston now runs a community arts ministry, a large free summer daycare program, tutoring ministries, recovery efforts, and more. It was a ministry of relationships. Talk about hands-on. I heard recently of another similar story. At least I hope you'll see the similarities. See, it wasn't about a church at all, but just one person who changed lives because he was risking using his own gifts. These were the stories I heard about Tim Sawyer at last week's memorial service. Now, Tim wasn't a church man, but he had a strong belief in what you might call a higher power. He was highly in tune with his own fears and frailties as well as his passions and gifts. And this ability gave him great empathy with other fellow travelers who were learning to live into their best selves. Tim had an affinity for serving as an arborist. It was his talent, if you will, as well as his spiritual home. In time, he developed a business to take care of other people's trees. I was one of his customers, only it didn't feel like being a customer. It felt like being a soulmate. And I had the feeling that Tim saw everyone that way. We were all soulmates. We were all on this journey together. When Tim decided to start a business, he needed people to work. You know where he found them? People who were just like him, wrestling with their own struggles, trying to learn how to be human, how to work, how to live, how to love. People others would call the least of these. People he would just call brothers. He taught them not only the business, he helped them to pick up pieces of their lives. He helped them thrive. He helped them help each other. He didn't think of himself as a hero or as a rescuer of lost souls, hardly. It wasn't a source of pride. It was the light and love in him, seeing and honoring the light and love of them. Not in flowery language, but in working side by side, creating something bigger and more beautiful than anything they could have done alone. He saw them for who they were and loved them. And he needed them as much as they needed him. What does hands-on mission look like? What does it look like? I don't know. I'm not really sure, but I know it involves turning to the source of our own light and the source of our own love and reflecting it back. I know it takes humility and I know it takes risk. And I know it's not about making ourselves feel good or look good or even necessarily about trying to help someone else feel good. 
It's about seeing Christ's light in ourselves and in each other and in the stranger and trusting that Christ's love can get us through any fear that we feel so that we can reach out and serve and be served. I hope, I dearly hope, that you will come to believe that it is worth the risk. That is what I hope. May it be so. As we come to a time of prayer, we have a number of things to pray for, including ourselves. Oh, you have prayers. We have a prayer request from Bill Acklin, who is serving on an administrative commission for the closing of a congregation in our presbytery, the Groveport Presbyterian Church. He says this is a sad and difficult mission for a church with a strong heritage of serving and ministering for over 160 years. And so he asks for prayers of hope and peace for their pastor, Chris, and for the session and all the members of Groveport in their journey to a new place of worship. The closing service is July 11th. I wanna remind friends that uh, there's a gathering to remember and give thanks for the life of George Todd next Sunday on July 4th from 12 to three in Opera House Park. I've also been asked to um, offer prayers for comfort for the family of Jason Keyes, age 46, who was fatally shot in a racially motivated incident last Sunday. And I'm so sorry to hear of that tragedy. Larry Miller asks for prayers for his son Benjamin, who is in an emergency room in Milwaukee with some kind of brain event. And we offer fervent prayers for a clear diagnosis and quick treatment um, for Ben. A prayer of thanksgiving for the donations for the blessing box and for the dedication at 1230 today at First Presbyterian in Newark and for everybody who gave for the bake sale. And also um, prayers of thanksgiving for a special event coming up Um, This Friday at the Granville Historical Society Museum, Jack Wyant is going to be speaking at three about his grandparents, Foster and Blanche Wyant, who were prominent and beloved members of this church and the wider Granville community. With all of the joys and concerns we carry in our hearts, let us turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, you are the source of love and light in all of our lives. Open our eyes that they may see the deepest needs of people. Move our hands that they may feed the hungry. Touch our hearts that they may bring warmth to the despairing. Teach us generosity that welcomes strangers. Let us share our possessions to clothe the naked. Give us the care that strengthens the sick and help us share in the quest to set the prisoner free. In sharing our anxieties and our love, 
our poverty and our prosperity, we partake in your divine presence. We thank you, God, for the saints who have gone before us, who have fed us, clothed us, seen us, loved us. We thank you for the paths you open so that we may open our hands and hearts more freely. We pray for churches everywhere searching for how to serve well and faithfully. And we pray for those who, having lived their lives in faith, now prepare to close their doors and join other communions of seeking, loving people. Bless all the gifts we bring and offer, and especially the offerings for our blessing box. May all who have need feel cared for. May all who give and all who receive experience the light and love of you, dear Lord. May we know our oneness in you, our rock and our redeemer, this day and always. For we make these prayers in Jesus' name, as we say together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God is going with us, and as we go, may the light and love of Christ in me see and honor the light and love of Christ in you, and may you share that light with one another. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit dwell in you so powerfully, now and always. Amen. Thank you.